Picture a lovely sunny spring day after a long, cold, lonely winter. And whilst your bandmates, Paul, John and Ringo, have a boring corporate meeting with a record label, you're casually hanging out in the garden of Eric Clapton's house. That's the setting in which George Harrison wrote, Here Comes the Sun, one of the most beautiful guitar parts and songs ever written. Hi, my name is Paul Davis and it's time to dig deeper into why it is so beautiful, what techniques are used and why it is pretty complicated to get it down properly. This riff is played in the key of A major, but it's capoed, or capoed, at fret 7. So from now on I'll refer to the chord shapes instead of the actual chord names to avoid any confusion. So it starts with a D. This is for you guitar players. So we immediately hear that a beautiful, light-hearted, syncopated melody is played over three chords. The D, the G, and the A7. But meanwhile, there is an ongoing pulsating rhythm that drives this riff forward at all times. Let me explain. This song actually starts at beat two, where the melody line starts. The first melody line is played over the D chord, the tonic sounding like this. You see it revolves beautifully around that D chord. All the notes are within the shape. So far so good. After two bars of D we're jumping to the G chord, the subdominant, the four chord. Like D is one, E is two, F sharp is three, G is four, the four chord. The subdominant chord has a relaxing and soothing sound. We're going away from home, from the tonic chord, the D chord, to the G chord. But everything is good, it's a nice little journey. And on this chord, we play this melody. So the notes are very basic, but the timing is syncopated, falling on the off beats. So it's one and two and three and four and, creating an agile, almost tiptoeing sounding line. The last bar and the last chord is the dominant, the five chord, in this case the A7. The perfect chord to end any chord progression with, since this chord really asks for a resolution. It creates tension and it makes us want to go to that D chord really bad. So tension and resolution. This is perfectly complemented with the melody on the A7 that walks up right back to the major third of that D chord, the starting note again. Cool. So, so far we've got a very basic 1-4-5 chord progression with a rather basic melody on top. So what's the deal? Well, apart from the fact that basic and easy are often very solid foundations of great songs, for this particular guitar part, there are quite some things we need to get right to make it sound as great as George plays it. But first, shameless plug time. Finally, after a lot of requests, my beginner guitar course Learn Practice Play has opened up again and is now available all year round. It's my masterclass for beginner guitarists that want to have a solid foundation of everything you need to know, either when you're starting out or when you already have some experience but you feel like you're missing some fundamentals or foundation of guitar playing techniques, etc. So go to learnpracticeplay.com to check it out. Thank you so much. Back to Here Comes the Sun. It's time to talk about the picking hand. Or should I say, the strumming hand. You see, in this song it's a bit ambiguous what he's actually doing. It hangs a bit in between of strumming and picking. And that's also where it can go wrong. You can do too much strumming or too little strumming. The key is to find a balance between strumming the accompaniment, the chords, and picking the melody on top. So we're doing both at the same time. Because we're singling out the melody notes, they get emphasized so you can easily distinguish the melody from the chords. It's not entirely as black and white as this though. Sometimes the melody note is doubled. 
to make it sound a little more full, but more on that later. Another thing to realize is that you incorporate a melody on top of the chords. So the highest note of the chord should be the one of the melody. So if the melody goes down to the second string, you don't want to strum the first string with it. The big problem is that it's almost impossible to write this down correctly in a tab. And since most people unfortunately learn by tab, the little details are often overlooked. You see, if you would write all the little nuances in a tab, the tab itself would look very crowded and overly complicated and unnecessarily weird. Because it's just a D chord with a melody on top. So if you understand that, you don't need to see all the weird stuff in the tab. Another thing that isn't as easy as it looks is to make a strumming motion and still be so in control that you can play whatever string or strings you need. Sometimes he plays one note and sometimes he almost hits an entire chord, but it's all done with the same strumming motion like this. Etc. So try not to make the strumming movement too big since that makes things pretty complicated to hit the right strings. So another key element of this riff, filler notes. So the main rhythm of this is just plain eighth notes. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and etc. But the melody doesn't fill all those spots. So what George does when the melody isn't playing is always, yep, no exception, filling up those gaps with chord strums in between. So this is either just the root notes or the root notes and a string above it. So this is a thing people sometimes seem to miss or to leave out at all, but it's so essential in creating that ongoing droney feel of this piece. So on the D chord, he mainly uses a D string as a fitting note because there isn't much room for, uh, because we just have four strings, so like this. You see, when the melody isn't playing, I'm moving over to the D string all the time. On the G chord, um, he's playing the melody on the second and the first string, but the bass notes of the chords are found on the low E as well as the A string, he plays them together. You see, just jumping up from the low to the highs. And on the A7 chord... Great, and now a little bit about the rhythm, syncopation. The key part of why it sounds so frivolous is the use of syncopation in the melody. So if you know the melody, which I'm sure you do, you can determine when to play the melody and when to play the chords in between. And I do this personally by always alternating between down and up. So all the beats are on the down strum, whereas the off beats always fall on the up strum. It's pretty easy to look at it this way. So on the D chord, it is as follows. Down, up, down, up, up, down, up, up. It's just the way the melody places itself on the strums. Pretty mathematical, but also pretty easy. So when I didn't say anything, in between the downs and the ups, I played a note, but not the melody, but just a chord. Down, up, down, up, up, down, up, up. You see? Just the way I look at it. And you can do that for each chord. Down, up, 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 up. And on the A, down, up, down, up, up, up. And thinking about it is more difficult than actually doing it because it's just, I do it automatically, I don't have to think about it. So saying it out loud is actually more difficult than just playing it. So you can clearly hear all those syncopated melodies. It sounds beautiful, right? But that's still not all there is to it. Because, four, dynamics. There is a broader story in this riff and that's communicated with how loud and how quietly he plays things. We talked about it, how the tonic and the subdominant felt comfortable, nice, not too much tension, just chill. But then on the A7, the dominant chord gives a strong sense of going somewhere and he emphasizes that greatly by playing it way louder. Just listen to the tune. Chill, chill. So it's the movement of melody, of chords, but also dynamics that makes this riff so difficult to play. Keeping the strumming motion while singling out the notes, the melody notes, is a real challenge. 
playing not too light, but not too heavy. Try to capture the airy feeling, but still the thrusting, forwarding motion of the steady eighth note rhythm. So here's the entire thing, played slowly and then a little more fast. Go. <laughs> This ostensibly easy riff has a deeper, much more complicated layer, where there's a fine balance between all the elements that makes this riff truly great. Here comes the sun. Please come back. Looking at the details of such an iconic piece may seem like nitpicking, but in the end, it's in the details where the differences lie. And when covering a piece like this, you don't have to copy it one on one. If anything, please make something from it yourself, add stuff from, add stuff to it, change it up, I don't mind. But when you're practicing something and learning a song, it's pretty essential to fully grasp what it is you're looking at and what you're hearing. <laughs> all the elements, also all the little details, are needed to understand and master it completely. So now we only talked about a pretty small piece of the song, basically just the intro. Further along uh, are some nice arpeggios and some odd time signatures too, but to be honest, those aren't the difficult part of this song. Not for the guitars, anyways. I leave it to you from here on out. Uh, with these handles, I'm sure you can get the rest of the tune down. Have a great day, everyone. And let me just say it one more time. My beginner guitar course is out and available all year round. I'm super proud of it. It turned out beautifully, and I think it fits many players um, and will be of great value to a lot. So more details on that on learnpracticeplay.com. See you later. Cheers.